And everything I'll share with you today is things that uh, I was always I, I was always curious whether the things that did work in Parker and Sons that took it from six and a half to 250 million still works because the world is changing. Um, so what we've done in hundreds of companies now is tested the various things that allowed Parker and Sons to get to where it got and see does the do the things actually still work and the things that still work, we ongoingly teach. And I'm going to share some of that stuff with you today um, to uh, to allow you not just, yeah, become better at your profession, but also enjoy it more, you know, uh, go to work and leave work feeling like you like are living in alignment, like you're not just pushing things upon a person that they don't need. You're genuinely making sure that they're fully aware of the various things they could have that could improve their life, improve their home, improve the efficiency of their home, so on and so forth. So everything I share with you, number one, genuinely works. Number two, should facilitate you... Um, getting a lot more sales while living like genuinely in, in alignment um, and, and being, and being moral. Cause I am, as I've trained more and more salespeople, I found myself combating this mindset where people would say, like owners would say to their technicians or to their CSRs, they would say, uh, they would try and convince a person that they're not selling. You're not selling. You're just yeah, you're providing options or you're just making them aware. I personally don't like that way of thinking because I believe you're negatively affirming the belief that some people hold around selling, that sales is bad. Sales is not bad. Sales is only bad if you lie. There was a gentleman in the industry that trained Parker and Sons to get to where it is today. He passed away like just under two years ago. His name was Rick Hutchinson, and, and he preached that. Sales is only bad if you lie. Um, so for any of you that if if sales makes you uncomfortable at all, um, you need to question why. Because uh, because because it is only bad if you lie. Otherwise, you are creating, you're facilitating awareness that allows any person make an informed decision. And without that awareness, they can't make, they can't possibly make the best decision for themselves. Because none of us can with 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 um, with a lack of awareness. So, <clears throat> we're starting with that. Uh, anybody can. Uh, Put up their hand, wave around, tell me to slow down. If you get uh, confused by the accent, I don't blame you. I confuse myself sometimes. Um, and uh, and we'll start going into it. I'll give you some, uh, I have five tips that I'm going to share. <clears throat> I have a lot more, but I think we're going to end up coming up on time. And I know you all have, uh, you, you've, you've all got some selling to do and some work to do. Um, and Brian, feel free to chime in whenever if you want me to uh, elaborate on something or or, or track back. Okay, so as I thought about this, um, I th I tried to think about it in the in in the order in which it could happen in a home. Um, so first things first, before anybody ever goes in to a home, uh, it's super important to know what your intention is. I heard Brian speak. I don't know was it last week or the week prior about you know gratitude pre the call because it puts you in that conducive headspace. Knowing your intention is the same thing. When I, so I've studied almost, almost, not all, but almost all of the most successful comfort consultants in the industry and in selling techs, and they almost all set an intention pre-call. What that intention did was it, it put them in a mindset that they felt like they could genuinely win in. And unless you enter into a home in that winning mindset, you honestly may as well go home because you're operating from uh you're not your 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 conviction level in yourself is significantly lower, and as a result, that will come off. And you're not going to you're not you're not just going to not do as good of a job. Your uh, in terms of creating awareness for the customer, you're probably also not going to make the sale. Uh, so having internal conviction pre-call is super freaking important. Obviously, engaging in training is going to help your conviction because your skill set goes up. But also, like, what is your what is your one intention going into this house? Um, and setting uh, setting that intention pre-call will keep you quite focused throughout the call. And we saw a huge correlation in those that do that and their closing percentage skyrocketing. And that can that can be achieved in various different ways. It could be you just verbally telling yourself what your intention is, if that grounds you in like this compelling place. But I've seen like one of our most successful comfort consultants in Parker, he... Uh, pulls around he's in the neighborhood and he pulls around to the corner right by the house and he plays out loud blasts it in his car it's a great day to be alive that song and sings it to himself and it puts him in this winning place to then go in and be incredibly compelling empathetic compassionate good listening skills aware uh, so whatever that is for you 
he, the, I, I say this with all of me, unless you're, uh, unless you can genuinely feel like you're in a winning mindset pre-call, you need to discover what are the various things you need to do to put yourself in there before you go into the call. And I, I don't want you to be late for a call, but I'd rather you be late and go in with a winning mindset than go in feeling like you are uh, operating from a mediocre place. Uh, that alone is that alone is going to change the trajectory of your, of your success. Like you can have all the selling techniques in the world. And if you're operating from a, like if your self-talk is garbage, your, um, if your self-talk is garbage, it, it's going to make your utilization of the things, you know, not that great. Uh, so I'm sure you've heard mindset, mindset, mindset over and over again, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, what is your intention or what is the one or two things that prime you to operate from a place of like, I'm badass, I'm compelling, I got this, I'm great at my trade, whatever that is for you. Uh, so intention, 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 intention. What is your intention and putting yourself in that winning, my, uh, p putting yourself in that winning uh, headspace. Um, <clears throat> so tip number one. Uh, tip number two. Firstly, firstly, helpful, raise hands. I can... I can uh, tweak accordingly. Raise hands. Was that helpful? Helpful? Good. We're liking where we're going. Okay. Love it. Uh, every tech should have and deserves their own theme music that pumps them up for calls. 100%. I love that. And, and, and different things work for different people. Like some people like vision boards, like looking at, you know, that dream life that they want to build for their family or, or whatever, or, or maybe that is gratitude. Um, it does differ uh, from person to person, but I agree. Everyone does deserve it. Uh, living in that winning headspace, regardless of what you're doing, even if it's doing your freaking hobby, it's a nicer place, nicer place to live. Um, okay, so so that was that. No focus on sales is a huge mistake that I see. Not so smaller companies. Uh, sorry, no focus in sales. This is a mistake that I see a lot of uh, companies that seek a lot of success but never really arrive. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> a lot of owners or managers or even technicians and salespeople themselves are, say for instance, it's getting toward the end of the month and we as a team have not been selling that much. And either you yourself or the owner or the comfort consultant says to you, or you say to yourself, I just need to sell something. So so, so I've seen so many times the owner goes, okay, I, I, I just, guys, I need you to sell something. And they list out a whole load of, they list out 15 to 20 things that you could sell and they sell, they tell you just go sell it. And you might have similar conversations like that with yourself. But when you're told to so sell 15 things or when you entertain the fact of selling like 15 things in your head, 15 things that you could possibly sell, what tends to happen is you're not that great at selling any of them. Um, when there's no focus on what thing you should sell, you tend to not become great at any of them. So what I've learned as I've, as I've worked with almost, not, not every, but 90% of the most successful companies in the United States they have a fo every month they choose an accessory of the month that they're going to focus on. Um, <clears throat> so that month, um, and either you can encourage this of your owners or just take it upon yourself that, um, that you're going to choose an accessory that, uh, you are going to bring up in pretty much every home, unless it's madly unapplicable, of course, um, or, or it's unapplicable, but, um, what we found over and over and over again, when there's one accessory of focus that month, the amount of uh, your that the amount of sales that that technician or corporate consultant makes is significantly higher than if they enter that month with I'm going to offer a whole host of things depending upon X scenario. Um, be with, with a lack of focus, it's like a person who tries to be good at everything; they tend to be good at nothing. When you focus on becoming great at selling. An ex one accessory every single month, you are just deepening your toolkit of what you are very effective and informed about speaking to um, and selling and creating awareness of uh, your, you, what would probably happen is you'll start to discover a thing that you really like speaking about. You feel quite uh, compelled about and passionate about, and you'll probably set you, what we found is you'll sell that for the rest of your career. Um uh, <clears throat> But that focus is huge. Um, I encourage you to run competitions among among your buddies. Like, all right, let's see how many. Um, I'm using an air scrubber as an example for HVAC, but but whatever the accessory is relevant to whatever trade, uh, you choose that accessory 
And you, I encourage you to create competition among your guys saying, Hey, let's see how many, let's see how many, um, of whatever accessory we can sell more of, uh, today or this week. And you're creating this healthy banter among each other. So you're gamifying the day as you navigate through your day. Um, but when I say focus, there's a whole load of things you can do to facilitate the success of a thing selling. So like, I would encourage you to have your, to have someone in the office or the owner give you a one sheet that is quite compelling that you literally can pass to the homeowner and give it to, just give it to the homeowner. So when you go into the home, you can say, oh, by the way, Mrs. Jones, um, we are, uh, we have an accessory um, on offer this month that we feel quite passionate about, makes a big difference to our customers. I encourage you to to, to look at it um, and I'll go about and take care of whatever it is in your home. Um, so, so giving that one sheet or having a one sheeter that basically sells the thing for you is one of the ways in which you can um, throw the kitchen sink at becoming very, very good at selling, at focusing on selling one thing that month. Another thing could be, you know, you could have your dispatchers or uh, you could have your dispatchers uh, call the, te- the the homeowner ahead of you saying, oh, by the way, Mrs. Jones, make sure you ask um, technician John about uh, our accessory of the month. Um, so they're priming their accessory of the month. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that we're very passionate about. So they're priming you before you before you even enter the home. Um, <clears throat> so my, my uh, and, uh, and there's a whole host of ways you can do this. But one last tip, set a goal for how many of that thing you want to sell that month. Uh, and I would and, and, and that month, your owner should pay you more when that thing is sold. So it's incentivizing you as a technician to sell more of it. Um, you're in- motivated to sell more of it. And you're motivated to put your focus at becoming absolutely great at selling it. And what you will find is you'll keep selling it for the rest of your career. Um, honestly, I'd even ask it, when it's relevant to have your tech, to have your homeowner, to have your the, the owner of the company put that thing in your house so you can feel and see how effective that thing is. And then as a result, you'll probably sell it with greater uh, conviction. But um, I want you to set a goal for yourself. How many, um, I'm using air scrubbers as another example, but how many of X accessory do I want to sell this month? I've got my owner on board to sell to, to to choose the accessory of the month for the company. They're going to give me more this month when I sell that accessory. And then I would encourage you to gamify it among one another. So every day you're bantering with each other. John, I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell three X, three, whatever accessory today. How many are you going to sell? And banter with one another because gamifying things doesn't just make life more fun. It genuinely contributes also to performance. Um, so uh, hopefully that makes sense, guys. Uh, raise a hands if that resonates. So picking accessory of the month. <clears throat> Glad you like it. Picking accessory of the month. Um, getting more, getting compensated more for that thing that month. Setting a goal and gamifying it amongst one another. And like banter with each other. Tease each other. I'm going to beat you. You're going to beat me. Da, 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 da. It's a lot of fun. And it actually creates greater commodity, like closeness between your technicians and especially lads in Phoenix, it's warm. It's kind of tough to be out there. You may as well make it fun. Um, so uh, pick an accessory every single month and drill at home. And then it allows, obviously, the owner to get prepared because they can stock up on that thing. Uh, <clears throat> so um, no focus on sales is the mistake I see. Not so great companies make. And the best companies, they have that focus. They ha- they pick an accessory every month. Um, okay, let me take a drink of water. I'm uh, shouting stuff at you guys. <clears throat> Tell me to slow down if you need me to at any point. Okay, tip number three. A big <clears throat> mistake I see contractors make um, is, and, and, and by the way, like you're not at fault for this. I, I, I made the mistake myself until I saw hundreds of when you start to when you speak to enough contractors, you start to see trends, and then you feel stupid not doing the thing that the most successful people are doing. So I only know this from being fortunate to see trends, and 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 hence why I'm sharing it with you. But what a lot of contractors make mistake they make is they try to create a perfect pitch for every product or for every scenario or for everything that they could possibly sell. Um, perfect pitches tend to be very elaborate and a person has been in the field for a long time and have sold a thing for very long that they feel very competent to speak to it. And when they write out that script, it's freaking elaborate. It's long. It's a lot to remember. And when you're on the spot talking to the customer, 
you get you can't you you're you're all caught up in yourself and you don't remember that script and it's honestly not very real to remember freaking 15 scripts or more um and as a result you don't have any effective script because you're in your head versus actually being present paying attention to the customer active listening being a good communicator you're in your head trying to remember a bloody script it's like back being back in school taking a test and i didn't like that you probably didn't either i don't want you in your head i want you present aware uh all of the things that actually contribute to you connecting accurately and adequately with the customer so when we in parker what we learned and now throughout all the hundreds of companies we every time we try to train on a perfect script or a perfect way of selling X, it went south most of the time. And we were like, all right, as we get bigger and 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 we have like almost 500 techs, we've now more because we have a Tucson location, but it's not, that's just not even remotely scalable. It's not even really working for, for, for when we, have, when we have fewer techs, certainly as we get larger, it's just not going to work. What is a scalable, simple way that we could bring opportunity up to the customer that would not be that would be relatively passive, um, <clears throat> so it wouldn't seem like aggressive, pushy salespeople, and it just cre creates awareness in the customer's eyes. What would that framework be that we could uh, that it could be applied to whatever the heck we're selling, whatever that is, whether that's freaking ice cream or whether that's a new water heater, whether that's a freaking a new AC unit, like literally anything. Um, obviously, none of us are selling ice cream, but I. I do say that because what I'm about to share with you is genuinely applicable to whatever you're selling, which makes it, uh, which brings a lot of ease to technicians because it gives you a tool that can apply to uh, to anything. Um, so <clears throat> it's called the I Noticed Most of Why framework. I've been speaking about it more and more lately. So you all may have heard this. Um, and, and for those of you who haven't, I'll enlighten you. For those of you who have, maybe a reminder may help. Um, so I Noticed Most of Why a framework that you can apply to whatever it is you're selling. So hypothetically, you go into um, you go into a customer's home, um, you are uh, called to uh, look at their water heater or you're called to uh, whatever whatever it is you're called to do, either you recognize an opportunity from that thing or you do a health and safety inspection and you see something else that's potentially wrong. Um, I am going to use an AC unit just because that's what I'm most comfortable with, but it, it applies to anything, right? So I notice most of why. <clears throat> I notice, Mrs. Jones, you have a 10 plus year old system. Most of our customers consider replacing after 10 years because it saves them so much money on their utility bills. May I ask why you do not? May I, may I ask why you have not? What that allows for is the customer Number one, to be aware that it might be worth considering. And it allows you get insight into their internal narrative. So you're now aware of what their self-talk is and you can speak to it. We have, what we found works best is we suggest every technician uh, tackles one objective and from there they move on. But if you, I notice most of why in every single home, and if you, I notice most of why in every single home, the your take home pay for that year would be drastically different. So either you do a health and safety inspection and you see something that genuinely the homeowner should be aware of, or you're called out for that thing and you see a thing that they should be aware of. Like <clears throat> as another example, and I'm sorry, I keep referring back to HVAC. I, I need to be more versed in uh, plumbing things. My technical knowledge is poor, but my uh, what works from a sales perspective is, is, is uh, relatively strong, but you get me, you could apply it to anything. So as an example with an air scrubber, I notice, Mrs. Jones, <clears throat> you don't have air filtration. Most of our customers consider having air filtration because, Mrs. Jones, the number one filter in your home is your AC unit. The next biggest filter is your lungs. Mrs. Jones, you can either buy a filter or be a filter. May I ask why you've never considered air filtration? I notice most of why. I notice, Mrs. Jones, you didn't buy ice cream today. Most of our customers consider buying ice cream because it's so hot outside. May I ask why you have not? Not selling ice cream. I'm just trying to show how freaking uh, applicable it is to whatever it is you're selling. Uh, I notice most of why. And if you make it part of your cadence that every call you, I notice most of why, because you've done your health and safety inspection. And I really do struggle to believe that if you did a health and safety inspection on every single call, there wouldn't be something that could benefit a homeowner. 
uh, that you would encounter. <clears throat> and then you, I noticed you noticed it. Most people, when they have X challenge, consider replacing it. May I ask why you have not? And may is just this polite way of, of asking a question. I notice most of why for everything. So if we refer back to the accessory of the month, I notice, Mrs. Jones, you don't have a whatever the accessory is. Most of our customers consider having it because of X, Y, and Z benefit. May I ask why you do not? So now <clears throat> you have your accessory of the month and you now have a successful framework that is um is is a is a is a is a killer at creating appreciation within the customer because you're creating you're you're passively bringing opportunity up to a customer you're just you're you you're, you're just bringing opportunity up it doesn't seem invasive it doesn't seem salesy it doesn't seem pushy i notice most of why um and, and particularly that may piece i've heard people say um oh uh, uh, I noticed most of, I noticed most of why and not putting in the may and it's received differently by the customer. May just creates this element of like politeness that typically brings one's guard down. Uh, I notice most of why. Watch, I you're very welcome to reach out to me at any time. I'm so curious how that changes your guys' results. Genuinely, in all of me, I speak to this with absolute passion because I've seen how much it's changed the lives of technicians and what they take home. Um, uh, and you can, you know, end your day saying I brought up things that this custom that, that my customers today genuinely needed. Um, does that make sense? Helpful. Hands up if we liked it. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and, and you let me know if you want me to elaborate on anything. Uh, have we, who here has used that before? Just curious, raise a hands. Okay. Who here has heard of it before? Okay. So most of you have not. That excites me. I love when people have not. Hopefully it's uh, something that excites you too. Um, good. I'm trying to, I share, I'm sharing, I'm sharing it more and more. Uh, so my secrets are less fresh and fresh, but if there's, if, if they work, I want people to have at it. So um, yeah, I, I'm really curious. That alone is it's such money, guys. Um, it really, really is. And you can be not having the greatest day, and it's, that's life. That happens sometimes. Um, and you're not having to remember this elaborate script. Instead, you're remembering. I notice most of why. I've seen people put it on their dashboard. Um, so it's just there uh, ongoingly in their head. If there's any owners on this call, I encourage you to go down the hall and say, I notice most of why. I notice most of why. I notice most of why. Like That's what Paul, my father-in-law, did a lot of. He would just Every time he'd see a technician, he'd say, I know it's most of why, I know it's most of why, until they were until they would say it to him when they saw him coming down the hall, because they knew what he was going to say to them. He was trying to drill in a tool into their brain that they knew that he knew worked. Um, okay. Uh mindful of time. Two other things I'm gonna share with you guys. <clears throat> Debriefing after every call. Uh actually, that's the end one. Let me do wrong kind of urgency first. Wrong kind of urgency. Another interesting thing I've seen. Um when I've studied hundreds of companies is we're thought and Brian, and Brian and I only geeked out a little bit on this last night. Like we all hear such cliche nonsense, garbage sales stuff sometimes like giving a person this weird, unauthentic compliment, like Brian suggests you don't. And I fully agree with him. It cringes me out every time. It's so they don't care whether you like the weather or not. They don't like, you know, you know, when a person says, Oh, how's the weather? Oh, great. Or how's the, what did you do this weekend? You know that person asking you doesn't really care. So it just feels authentic and yucky. I think the same applies with other things that are thought to salespeople. Um, one of which is um, the way in which urgency is thought. Some people, uh, many people teach, um, like, for example, and I, and I apologize for alluding to the HVAC world, I need to uh, uh, clean up on my uh, technical plumbing stuff, but the same applies. Uh, they go into a home and they say, Mrs. Jones, you don't want, well, you don't want your AC unit going out when it's 110 outside. Um, when it's 110 outside, you, uh, you should, um, you should buy now. So what a lot of people teach is they teach people how to create future urgency, future urgency. Yeah. Use it, but it's not that effective. Um, I've seen it hundreds of times that the trend is so freaking apparent. Um, 
Wrong kind of urgency. Future urgency is not that great. You can use it, but what really moves the needle is is current is current pain. So future pain, not that future pain as a as a way of creating urgency is not that powerful. Current pain as a way of creating urgency is far more powerful. And I what I what I share with people is even if you go to a doctor and the doctor says, the doctor says, like, John, your your blood pressure is through the flip and roof. You're overweight, your blood pressure's through the roof, your uh, cholesterol's too high. If you don't change, you know, you're 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 taking at least five years off your life. So we leave the doctor. We might not get McDonald's that week. We might work out a little bit more. We might drink more water. We might drink less beer. And then two weeks later, we're back to doing the same stuff. I'm also at fault of that. Like, truly. If the doctor can't create enough future pain that would cost us our life, what makes us as technicians, as comfort consultants, as homeowner professionals create enough pain that causes a person uh, to move? It, it, if a doctor can't do it, it should bring enough. It, it, it's mad that that people continue to push this as the best way to create pain um, when it's just far less effective. If doctors can't do it, what makes us believe we can be madly effective at doing it? You can use it because yes, it creates behavior. It creates uh, it it facilitates behavior change uh, to a point, but used in isolation is not enough. Current pain. So thinking about the things that are genuinely bothering the customer right now is what will push the customer to make the decision. Um, so as an example, like um, I encourage you, again, I apologize, I encourage you to reflect back on things that are relevant to your trade. But as an example, in the HVAC world, um, you know, uh, your their, 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 their utility bills are just way too bloody high. And that hurts them from a financial comfort perspective every month. Speak to that. Or their kids have asthma and they're not sleeping as well as a result of uh as a result of their uh, their ac unit not being uh, you know, I know uh, an up to date unit or they they have poor filtration or whatever it is so whatever current pain you need to identify what their current pain is and then speak to it so it's your job to identify their current pain i would not really worry about future pain you can use it but i really I I I I really really encourage you to find out like as you sit down at the on at the table with the customer say Mrs Jones, what about this is um is bothering you, um what about this situation is bothering you and um get don't just get surface level stuff really figure out what is the current pain like and and then you're you're going to get so much insight into what their current pain is so that when you do come to the offer at the end and you're providing those options, you are very informed on the things that uh, are hurting them the most. And as a result, they're the same things that will motivate them the most to make the decision that you believe is best for them. Uh, and you're you're offering the thing that you believe is best for them. Um, so you're uh, putting yourself in a much more successful position for them to actually move and make that decision. So when you go and sit in the sit on the, sit on the table with the customer, current pain, your job, Current pain, current pain. What are their current pains? What are their current pains? And you don't have to accept surface level stuff. You can ask, okay, why does that bother you? And asking a why question and an open-ended question like that facilitates one elaborating. And from there, you'll get information. Does that make sense? That's what equips us to be so much better than a robot. We can ask informative questions, connect with a human on an emotional level, and then... Uh, use that information later to help them make a, a good decision. And um, some people, you know, even sometimes when I teach it, I'm like, is that manipulation? My argument is manipulation is when you are encouraging somebody to make a decision that's not good for them. But if you're encouraging a person to make a decision that is good for them, you're doing your job. Manipulation is when you're do when you're pushing a pushing a thing upon a person that's not good for them. But if you do the health and safety inspection, you pass you you bring it up in a in a in a rapport building way. I notice most of why, uh, while using the current pains you're now aware of, and you genuinely in your heart believe this person would benefit from that thing. Current pain is going to get you a long way, and it's allowing you emotionally connect with the person because the current pain is something that creates emotion in them, and you're allowing and people buy the emotion. People people typically don't buy the logic. 
Does that make sense? Raise your hands if that makes sense. Helpful? Genuinely, you don't need to butter me up? Okay. Okay. Um... Uh, do, 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 do. I had something else that came to my mind and I forget what it was. If I think of it, I'll share it with you all. But um, I thought it was something you want, you'd want to hear too. Bummer. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'll text Brian later if I think of it. But the last, so the last thing I'm going to teach is um, debrief after every call. I really want to remember that thing, guys. I'm sorry. Whatever. It might come to me. Debrief after every call. So as I've learned... Oh, I have, I, re I remember, I thought of it, great. I'll give you that at the end. Uh, as I have, uh, as I've, you know, studied a lot of successful people, which kind of gets me jazzed up and I'm passionate about, people, the most successful people typically tend to love accountability. It's people that are not that great that veer away from accountability. They don't like it because they don't want to be shown up. They don't want to be shown up to themselves. They don't want to be shown up to their peers. However, if you can cultivate self-accountability, it's powerful. Um, from that place, you can really be real with yourself about where you're at and grow accordingly. So what a lot of owners have introduced, but as a technician, you can introduce it for yourself, is debriefing after every call. So uh, I, I, uh, I have owners create a debrief checklist of the various things that they want to help their technician become very good at. And after every call, the technician calls the service manager um, and they go through the checklist like, okay, what did you, I noticed most of why on that call, if you discovered their water heater was 10 plus years old, was that one of the options? So, um, did I set an intention at that call? Uh, did you do a health and safety inspection? Um, so, so, so the moral of the story is I would create a checklist for yourself of the various things that would allow you to win on a call, the various things that if you did you have a much higher likelihood of winning on this call. And then when you get back into your truck after that call, pick up that checklist and, and debrief, reflect with yourself. If, if it's not part of your culture where you call the owner or the service manager or whatever that is, do it yourself. Um, and honestly, that's way more empower that's way more empowering than feeling like, you know, someone's checking up on you when typically they're not, they're trying to help you win, but uh, uh, maybe it's both. Um, but uh, if you have that sheet, you can look at it and say, okay, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? And you can reflect as to why you did not and therefore incorporate it into your next call. So you've probably heard it takes 10,000 hours to become good at a thing. That is and isn't true. It takes 10,000 deliberate hours where you don't just engage in the thing. You are deliberately practicing. You're doing the thing. You're reflecting. You're tweaking and you're doing the thing again. Like you could hit a freaking golf ball 10,000 times and be have a, excuse my language, kind of shitty, kind of shitty swing like I do. And I'm never going to become good, even if I do it for 10,000 hours. I, I might become a little bit better. But if I'm deliberate and I'm tweaking the thing based upon, you know, accurate, good advice, I, um, my behavior changes. So after every call, come out, look at your checklist, reflect on what you did well and what you could have done better. Did you incorporate the things that you believe would lead to a winning call? And that's not just the things I've thought, obviously. There's a whole host of things that you know work very well, you work for you, resonate with you, incorporate them in your winning checklist, but create that winning checklist, keep it on your dashboard as an example, and reflect after every call. Did I do these things? Okay, if not, why not? What could I do better? What did I do well? Always acknowledge what you did well too. And I encourage you all to, there's a great book called The Gap and the Gain. As we're all growing, there's always a place we could be, but there's also a big gains that we've already made. And what, um, there's a great study and it's a great freaking book. Actually, it's, it's not like a, an annoying book. It's like a really conversational good book called the gap of the game. Um, and it, it, what it speaks to is the people who acknowledge the gains they've made in life versus live where the gaps are actually succeed so much more. So yes, when you reflect, I want you to think about the things you could have done better, but I also want you to acknowledge your wins. Um, and beyond that, I want you all to live in a place of the gain. So yeah, all right, I know I can get better, but I'm acknowledging and appreciating all the freaking gains I've made. I didn't make this money last year. My closing percentage wasn't this last year. I didn't have as much work-life balance last year. I lost two pounds this year versus last year. Live in the gain and it facilitates more momentum. Um, so I really, really, really heavily encourage you live in the gain. Great book, Gap in the Gain and genuinely freaking 
uh, enjoyable to listen to because sometimes those audible books, the narrators bore the head off me. That one will not. Um, Gap in the Gain, really good book. Live in the Gain, self-reflect, debrief after every single call will genuinely change the course of your uh, of your career. Uh, self-reflection is incredibly powerful. Um, okay, last thing that I thought of, uh, and I'll let you guys go. Uh, one theme that I've seen across the industry, and it was madly uh, enlightening for me. This is not really, this isn't, this is and isn't sales related. It's more ge de uh, generic advice. Um, but a theme that has been really freaking eye opening and cool for me to see. As I speak to hundreds of technic, maybe thousands of technicians at this point, hundreds of owners, um, the people who operate from the place of I'm going to shoot for the moon and at least if I land upon the stars, I still won. The people who operate from that place tend to lose. The people who instead say, uh, like as, as, as business owners, I'm, I did six and a half million last year. I'm going to do seven and a half million this year. Or I had a closing percentage of, I had a closing percentage of, I don't know, 50 last year. I want to have 55% this year or 40 last year and I want to have 45% this year. Small goals is what allow is what allows the two the companies that have hit 250 million, the company that the comfort consultants that are the highest comfort consultants in the industry, uh, highest selling techs in the industry, they set small goals and annihilate the crap out of them. What I've learned, the reason why that happens is they can wrap, they can mentally wrap their head around it. You know, if you set such a big audacious goal, you can't even freaking resonate with it because it's so far in the future. And therefore you can't rack up your heads around hands around hand and heads head around it. It doesn't seem actionable. So my advice to all of you on this call is that whole shooting for the stars and you land up on the moon, nonsense, doesn't work. I've seen it over and over and over and over. And I once adopted that belief because you hear it spoke, but I've seen it. I've seen it and I encourage you all to engage in conversations with very, very successful people. And I can almost bet you um, the majority of them that don't just have that actually have the fruits of success. Um Think small. They set achievable goals and annihilate the heck out of them and then reset. Annihilate the heck out of them and reset. Annihilate the heck out of them and reset. It's a very empowering place to live. Um, does that make sense? All right. Cool. Um, I think we're on time. I, I told Brian I'd, I'd finish up. Um, I, I do 45 minutes or so because I don't want to. Uh, he may have plans for how he wants to end this. Um, but I hope that was helpful. Anytime, honest, honest to God, my heart is here to give. Um, you're welcome to text or email me. Um, my cell is 702-487-1979. 702-487-1979. Brian, you're welcome to share that. My email is laura at growwithclover.com. Uh, I'm here to just give. Yes, we have a business that helps and grows people, but... I believe many of you are technicians and that's not our primary offer. Um, so I'm here to just, uh, we typically help GMs and owners how to grow their businesses and you all are a big part of that. Um, but I'm here to just help. So you're welcome to call me, text me. Um, I might not be able to get back to you straight away, but I certainly will try and carve out time wherever I have it. Um, these things I'm sharing with you genuinely work. Uh, they genuinely create impact. Um, and, uh, there's no BS here straight from the heart, straight from things that, uh, create healthy bottom lines for business owners 